good word for Jesus. You don't have to be around 9th and O uh, very long before you hear our pastor use these six words, right? And, uh, you know, there are a number of cookisms uh, that if you're around long enough, you'll hear over and over again. But this is one that he has said to us for so long. And you hear those words and you might wonder, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to speak a good word for Jesus? Well, I want to propose to you that we think about it in terms of three circles, okay? You're going to see the three circles here on the screen. The, at the middle of, 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 this, uh, of this diagram here is the gospel. This is evangelism. This is sharing the, the, the truth about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. This is the core, right? Now, on the outer rim, there is pre-evangelism. Uh, these are, are many of the things that we did yesterday. Um, doing things in the name of Christ, uh, being kind, um, even, even being able to share that where we go to church, why we're doing these things. All these things can be pre-evangelism, inviting people to church, uh, praying with people, all types of examples that we can think of in terms of pre-evangelism. It's kind of a, a broad, generous understanding that we're cultivating the soil, right? Preparing people as we engage them with the gospel. Now, the centering is this, that, that acknowledgement. At some point, we've got to make the move, right? At some point in our conversation with people, we're talking about generalities or, or general spiritual things. But at some point, we've got to talk about Jesus, right? We've got to make that move. So that's what these three circles represent. And what I want to do this Sunday and then next Sunday is I want to put some meat on the bones, of what these three circles are and what they mean and how we go about living them out. So next week, uh, we're going to look at the core. What is the gospel? What is evangelism? So we're not going to tell you what the gospel is this week. You're going to have to wait. It's a cliffhanger. Come back next week. Uh, but today, what I want us to do is I want us to look at this idea of, of what is pre-evangelism and how do we move toward the center? How do we make this transition? Today, our text is going to be in Acts chapter 9. I've entitled our sermon, A Chosen to Speak. As God's people, we are chosen to, to speak a word, good word for Jesus. But I also want to look at what are those things that, that hinder us, that keep us from sharing the gospel. And I want to conclude with just uh, some practical application for how we can make these transitions in, in, in going from generalities to talking specifically about the gospel. So common hurdles to evangelism. There's about a million reasons why we might not go up to somebody uh, today and share the gospel. But I've kind of I've kind of narrowed it down to these six because I think these six are, are the ones that are most common for me personally. And I have a feeling they're the reasons you don't share as well. One of them is just a general fear. All right. I don't really want to go up to that person and share because what they might think of me or I might offend them. This can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. It's, it's a fear of man. But I, but I would attest that, that the greater fear is a lack of fear. It's a lack of fear of God. Lack of fear of, what, of doing what God has called us to do, right? So I think fear is the main reason that we don't want to go and share the gospel. We don't want to move from that outer rim where we're comfortable to, to what's maybe uncomfortable, uh, to, to the center. So I would say uh, fear. The next one is, is, is ignorance. Now, the reality is, as I look across this room, the vast majority of you, you probably could articulate the gospel. Uh, you know it, but to be able to say it, it's a little different. I think for us, the ignorance is sometimes we don't really know how to express it. We don't know the method or, or how the order we should go in. That, that's why I, I think sometimes when I, when I think of ignorance, it's not that we don't know what the gospel is. We don't know how to share the gospel in a way that, that we feel would be palatable for the person that we're, we're sharing with. A third one is just apathy. And this is a sad reality. It's a reality in my life a lot of times that I just don't care enough about people. That's a hard thing to, to say out loud, isn't it? Because you would think right theology would always re lead to right practice, right? But sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we don't need to look very far in the Bible to see that just because you know the right things doesn't mean your heart's been changed. So as the people of God, we've got to, we've got to um, really foster compassion in, in our hearts towards uh, the lost. And we do that through prayer and through a number of different avenues. But apathy is a real problem. I think personal hypocrisy. Uh, the truth is there are people that know you at work. There are people that know you at school. And the, 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 the church you and the work you and the church you and the school you doesn't always align, right? 
And sometimes it's a little awkward uh, to, to act one way and then to invite them to church and say, you know, I'm actually not living really my faith how I should. So sometimes there's a, a hypocrisy uh, that happens. Maybe we've had an ugly interaction with a neighbor, whatever it might be, but, but it keeps us from wanting to share the gospel. Another one that I think is, is, is so true today because of primarily our cell phone is just the busyness. We just don't have time. We don't have the margin. Uh, our eyes are so down all the time on, on devices and what's in front of us. We don't have the eyes to see all that God might be doing around us. And this is a, this is a real struggle uh, for me. And the last one I would just say is giftedness. Now, we do know that the Bible says that there are those that do have the gift of evangelism. But we also know that we're all car- called to be evangelists. So obviously it's going to become, it's going to be more natural for some, but it doesn't preclude any of us from, from sharing the good news. So these are all the hurdles uh, that, that we don't want to jump over oftentimes when it comes to evangelism. And I will tell you, Satan, he is subtle and he is clever and he is cunning and he will keep us from jumping these hurdles. He'll do everything he can. Uh, he will, he will, he will discourage us to the point we think we don't even know how to jump anymore. Um, or, or sometimes, uh, we also just stop jumping, uh, because we feel justified for some reason, one reason or another for not sharing the gospel. And as you look at these, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that there's one, maybe two, maybe six of these that stand out to you and say, you know, that's me. And this is really hard. I really don't want to hear a sermon on evangelism today because it just reminds me that I've got to grow. I've got to do better. And maybe the Lord's bringing specific people uh, into your mind. But this is exactly where we need to be. This is what the Bible does. The Bible tells us how we should live. And we have to compare it to how we are living. And this is how God does a work in us. And in my prayer, my hope today is that our hearts would be aligned with our Lord's heart when it comes to seeing people. And uh, so that's what I want us to look at today. As I said, we're going to be in in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to work through the first 22 verses of that passage uh, today. And we're we're really going to be looking at the conversion of Paul, uh, who we know as Saul as well. And you know, Saul was a man from Tarsus. Tarsus was an affluent city. It was a city known for its educational systems. It was known uh, for its colleges and universities. So no doubt that that played an influence on on Saul and his his upbringing. We know from Scripture that that Saul's father was a Pharisee. We know that that Saul was a Pharisee as well. So obviously he had been in Jerusalem. He'd studied under the most respected rabbi um, of of his day. Uh, That was Gamaliel. And in terms of the biblical storyline, we're first introduced to Saul, if you remember, and for you adults, we've been looking at this in our BFGs, um, in Acts chapter 7. He was there at the stoning of of Stephen. And then we read in chapter 8 and verse 1, I'll just read this to you real quick. And Saul approved of his execution, referring to Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So Dr. Luke here leaves us uh, uh, no doubt that Saul is at the center of this persecution of these early Christians, these first Christians uh, there in Jerusalem and outside of Jerusalem. And what I want to do is I want to work through this text this morning, then we're going to come back and look at some application that I think is going to be helpful for us, for us today. But Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, it says, But Saul, he still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked the, him for letters to the synagogues at, at Damascus, so that he might find anyone belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So we see this visual of, of breathing threats and murder. And this is a powerful visual. For something to be your very breath, That means it is at your core. It is your personhood. It's what you feel called to. It is what you are passionate about. And he is passionate about eradicating the world from this Christian virus caused by this Jesus of Nazareth, right? And and he wants to get rid of the people of the way, which is no doubt a reference back to what Jesus said, that he was the, the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. So he's traveling to Damascus. And Damascus was a city that had a massive Jewish population. 
And for some reason, he's got to go to the synagogue. He's got to ask permission uh, to persecute the Christians. And, and this is exactly what he's doing. He's on this road and he has a game plan. He has a path that he's taking. But what we see is that Saul's life is about to be changed forever. And our lives are about ready to be changed forever. It says here in verse 3, it says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. You know, in just a, a few hours, we'll come back tonight and at church and the, the service will dismiss. And, you know, there will be a lot of children in this building. And you know what those children do when we are dismissed from evening service? They make a beeline, don't they? They know a BCN is on. And there's only so many of the good things, right? You don't want those last things that nobody wants at the BCN. So our kids, they will move with purpose and they will move with pace out into that lobby to get what they can get, right? And as we think about about Saul in this text. He is moving with both great pace and purpose because he has a mission to persecute the people of God. But what happens? He ends up falling on his face as he has this miraculous encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, ironically, the last person to see the resurrected, resurrected Jesus was Stephen. It said that he appeared to Stephen as he was being stoned to death. And now we see that he's appearing to Saul, the one that oversaw the stoning. And notice these words from Jesus. They're very curious, aren't they? They say, why are you persecuting me? So we see this, this inseparable link that Jesus sees between himself and his church, his people, the body of Christ. That's exactly what's happening here. You know, we, we are living in a strange time, aren't we? Um, when you think about all that's happened in our country over the last several weeks and in, in politics, I heard someone say the other day, July has just been a crazy decade, right? And so much has happened. But when you think about politicians today, okay, what is the very worst thing ever that can happen to a politician? The worst thing ever that can happen to a politician is to admit they're wrong, right? You just don't hear people admitting they're wrong. It's their worst nightmare. And imagine for Saul, Imagine for Saul, what is his worst nightmare that's getting ready to take place in, in, in this story? He's going to have to admit he's wrong. He's going to have to admit he's on the wrong side. He's got to admit that Jesus truly is the Messiah. So you have all of these things happening and his worst nightmare is coming to pass. And notice that we see a, a, a spiritual turn begin to happen in Saul's life because he says, who are you? He doesn't say, who are you, man? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, who are you, sir? He says, who are you, Lord? So God is doing something. Verse six, he said, but rise and enter the city and you'll be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him, they stood speechless. They heard the voice, but they could see no one. So Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So we see what, what happens here. Jesus tells Saul, go into Damascus. But man, this scene is totally different than what Saul thought was going to happen. He thought he was entering into the city, that he was going to be this conquering hero. He was going to eradicate this virus of Christianity. This was his mission, his goal in his life. But how is he entering? He is humbled. He can't even walk into the city by himself. He needs help because he is blind. See, the Lord knew that, that, that saw his pride ran so deep and that if he was going to pierce his heart spiritually from his spiritual blindness, he was going to have to physically blind him. Then in verse 10, we're introduced to another uh, person in the story. It says, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Ananias drew the short straw in this story, didn't he? Ananias said, Lord, uh, said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, I want you to rise. I want you to go to a street called Straight, to the house of Judas, and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Obviously, God's at work in Saul's life. And, and he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Verse 13, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on his name. So what is Saul doing? 
He's blind. He's in Damascus. He's waiting. He's fasting. He's praying. And God instructs this, this believer named Ananias to go to him with instruction. And Luke informs us that, that again, Saul is praying. There's, there's spiritual transformation happening in his life. And I'll tell you what, Ananias had, he wanted no part of this. He had no desire. Okay, we can joke about how he wouldn't want to go to him, but he may have very well had friends or family that were persecuted or killed by, by Saul. He had no desire to see this man saved, I'm guessing. But he does go to him, and, 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 and he, he, he does exactly what God has called him to do. And then in verse 15, we have this powerful ver verse where it says, But the Lord said to, said to him, Go, for he, for Saul, Saul is my chosen instrument. And he is to do what? He's to carry his name before the Gentiles and the, and, and the kings and the children of Israel. What a mission. And he says, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias, he departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Acts 9.15 is a powerful verse. We should not pass over it lightly. These words that he expresses to the apostle Paul, uh, which obviously were not Paul, but there is a mission given to him that, ex that ex extends to us as well is that he's a chosen instrument. And when a carpenter picks up an instrument and he chooses one, you gotta get the right one, right? And that's exactly what he does. He picks the right instrument for the job. Saul was that right person. We are that right person to do what he has called us to do. We see that the spirit is filling Saul. Now he is able to accomplish all that God has called him to do. And that's exactly what we see him fulfilling in verses 20 through 22. He goes out, he preaches the gospel. It, it always stinks when the best player on, on your team transfers to the other team, right? And that's exactly what's happened here to the Jews. Their, their greatest weapon against Christianity has converted to the other side. And God has great things in store. And I think Luke recorded this story for us for a reason. I want to pull out four points of application that I think are going to be helpful for us as we try to uh, gain that courage and that boldness to share the gospel. And the first one is that the Lord changes the hearts of his most vocal opponents. The Lord changes the hearts of his most vocal opponents. Do you wonder if anybody was actually praying for Saul? Here's the deal. Ain't nobody praying for Saul. You don't pray for things that don't happen, right? That's how we live life. We don't, we don't, we don't even consider that as even a possibility. Yet no one is outside the reach of God's saving grace. And here's the deal. We so often put restrictions on God. We look at people and we think in terms of probability uh, of, of where, where, uh, grace might extend itself. And we might see this person say, no way. This person, maybe they're on their way, right? And so we put all of these limitations on God, but, but rarely does it cross our minds to not only just pray for those that seem to be in great opposition to the Lord. We don't even think, it doesn't even cross our mind that we might be involved in that process, that he might want to use us. But be encouraged today to know that those that are far from God are not far or outside of God's reach. First thing. Second thing, that the, the Lord changes hearts on a dime. Let me read for you verse 1 of chapter 23 of Acts. Paul is, is, is sharing before the Sanhedrin, and they're asking him questions, and he's sharing his faith story. And he says, and looking intently at the, at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And what does that mean? That means that he, he didn't feel guilty. He was enjoying what he was doing. There were no, if you were watching the life of Saul, there were no nudgings. There was no um, whisperings of God's movement in his life. And if we consistently, as we think about evangelism, only look for ripe people, people that are ready to be picked when it comes to sharing the gospel, when we start playing those mind games that there are some people that are ready and some that aren't, we end up probably almost never actually sharing the gospel. We talk ourselves out of it.
But we, we have to be careful that we don't limit God. You know, we, we talk about putting a governor on a car so it can only go a certain speed. I think that I do that spiritually sometimes. I put a governor on God and what he might want to do. So just be encouraged to know in one day, God changes everything. In one, God, in one day, Paul changes from one team to the other. And God bridges that amazing 18-inch gap between Paul's head and his heart. A third thing we see is that, that the Lord changes hearts for our encouragement. Did you know that, that Saul was saved for you and for me and for all of us, that we would need this story? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, we read, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason. Why did God save Saul? He said, for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, the foremost sinner, Christ Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. God knew that for some of us, we would need the example of Paul's salvation. God knew that we would need the example of God demonstrating long suffering towards a sinner. That could be you, that could be someone that's close to you that you love, but we need this example of how God works in people's lives. The fourth and final thing I want us to notice is that the Lord changes hearts in order for his disciples to become chosen instruments. And just as Paul was a chosen instrument, so we too are. I, I hope this passage gives you a, a renewed sense of purpose. Because let's admit it, in life, it is a terrible life if you don't have purpose if you don't have calling, if you don't know what you're here for. But all you need to know is Acts 9.15, that just like the Apostle Paul, you are a chosen instrument. God has placed you perfectly where you need to be to fulfill what he has called you to do. And that's what we are called to do, to live faithfully. And, you know, God places us in the path of people. And, and I assume at this point, the Lord has probably brought, brought people to your mind that you would use so long to see them saved. You'll do anything short of sin to see them saved. You might, be even, you might even be willing to say, I'll cut off a limb to see this, this person in my home saved or this friend or whoever it might be. Yet at the same time, maybe we've not even shared the gospel with them. So before you go cutting off your limb, take a moment and share with them about Jesus. Because so, so often there's an inconsistency in my life that I say I care for people, but you wouldn't know it by my actions. And it's really what in life, a lot of times, it's your actions that really count. And that's really what illustrates what's in your heart. So how do we move? How do we move from this outer rim of pre-evangelism, of doing kind things, of inviting people to church, to talking to people about Jesus? Well, first let me just say there, this is an art. There's an art to turning these conversation because it's not a, it's, I think when I was younger, I used to think you have to share these five bullet points and don't talk. I got to get through them all or I got to walk through this track. Don't talk. I might get confused. It's not that way of all at all. It's, it's a fluid conversation between you and another person. But the first thing I would say, just an overarching principle is that repetition is key. You think about, there's a lot of things in life that you repeat, that you repract, that you practice, Right. And whether you're a student or an athlete or even at work, there are things that you do and you do them again and again in order to get better. Well, we need to practice. And let me just tell you, does it seem inauthentic to say I'm going to practice evangelism? Uh, yeah, to go into a mirror and practice, that doesn't seem real authentic. I understand that. But let me just tell you, don't you think the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased when he sees his children care so much that they're willing to do, do something that might seem foolish on the outside and to practice something like this? And, and here's the deal. The more you do it, the more you share, the easier it becomes. A second principle I would say is that just embrace the awkward. We all know that to have that conversation and to engage in that type of spiritual conversation where you're speaking to their soul and to their heart and to their eternity, that's, that's a little awkward. But you know, life is filled with awkward. We've all, you know, for those of us that are older than 15, we've all been pre-teens. We've all been awkward, right? This is just a little bit more awkward. And so what, what, what I would say is that just know when you're having these conversations, that moment of awkwardness will just last a moment, but it's over. 
and, 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 and the, the joy and the blessing that comes with obedience, it lasts so long. It is such a great blessing. And the reality is when you're sharing, they're probably more self-conscious than you are. They probably feel more awkward than you do. And, and I'd also just submit to you that if you have a relationship with this person, don't you think that they expect you at some point to talk about your faith? Wouldn't you expect that if you had a good friend that was of another faith, that at some point they would talk to you about what they believe? You know, there's a famous YouTube video uh, from, from Penn uh, Juliet. If you don't know who Penn Juliet is, he is the famous Penn from Penn and Teller, the magicians in Las Vegas. And Penn has this uh, YouTube video, you can look it up. He basically says, if you're a Christian and you don't share the gospel with me, and again, Penn is an atheist, if you're a Christian and you don't share the gospel, how much do you hate me? How much do you hate me? You are living with such inconsistency in your life. I would expect every Christian to share the gospel. And, and, and we should if we are living consistent with what we believe. The last um, suggestion I would make is that, that we, should, we should listen and ask questions. And, you know, the more you listen, the better. You get, they get to express uh, how they feel. Um, they get to tell their story. They know that you care. Uh, also, when somebody's sharing their story, it helps me to know how I might want to uh, share my story and, and how Jesus' story and what he's done for them might best connect to their story. So again, this is not a monologue. It is a conversation that you have uh, with another person. So I think you keep these things in mind. Okay, but now how do we press through from that outer circle to turning the conversation? Let me give you five quick concepts, five quick ideas that I think have been most helpful for me, and I hope that they'll be helpful to you as well. Here are different ways that we bridge the gospel. And again, let me just say, out of context, do these sound cheesy? Maybe a little bit. Are they less cheesy when you do it? Yes, they're less cheesy. But the first one is, is a prayer bridge. You have the opportunity all the time probably to pray for people. Anytime somebody mentions something good in their life or really bad in their life, you can turn and say, you know what, I'm a person of faith. Can I pray for you? And guess what? When they say yes, you get to pray whatever you want, right? You can say whatever you want. You can just pray through the Roman road. You know, that would be great too. So offer, offer up to pray for people. You have the opportunity to follow up with them um, as well. So that is maybe the easiest way to begin to move from pre-evangelism to actually sharing the truths of the gospel message. A th second thing I would say is just a church bridge. I don't know about you, but church is kind of a big part of my life. Uh, it would be unnatural for me not to talk about church. It would be unnatural for me not to talk about VBS or, or, or student ministry activities or, or mission trips I go on or just being a part of a small group. And, and so as you bring these things up in your daily life, it is not hard to transition to say, you know what? Church is such a big part of my life. You know, faith is a big part of my life. You know, I would, I mean, you're my friend. I'd love to share with you why it's so important. And they say yes, and then you get to do whatever you do, want to do. You can share all about the gospel. You can say what the church means to you and what it points to in Jesus Christ. So I think that is a great way to just jump into your faith story. A third one is just a personal faith bridge. And this is someone, if I don't know them very well, I may just ask them questions about their faith. So tell me, what was your upbringing? Uh, did you guys go to a church or a synagogue or a mosque? What was that like? You know, what were some of the things that you learned? You start asking questions and they're talking about themselves. And then at some point, it's only natural that you are able to share your faith, right? So I think just a, a personal faith bridge. One that, man, we have so many opportunities to use right now is a, a current issues bridge. Have you heard about blank? Uh, there is all types of things happening in our world today that can help you transition into talking about Christianity. I mean, even the Olympics are giving things uh, for us to talk about Christianity about right now. Uh, this past week, um, my brain hurt, but I did listen to the entire two-hour um, video interview between Jordan Peterson and Elon Musk. I don't know if any of you uh, listened to it. Quite fascinating. You're going to have to look up a bunch of words when you hear these two uh, geniuses speak. But in, the, in about the midway through this conversation between Peterson and Musk, Musk says, you know, I'm really just a cultural Christian. And, and what he's saying is, like, I believe in the morality of Christianity. I believe that it is the best. It, when you look at the, the, in the marketplace of worldviews out there, Christianity has the best morality, the best way to live life. Well, you can engage in that conversation with someone, and you can say, you know what's funny is that, and, and you don't have to say exactly a, a, a scripture verse, but you might say something like, you know, in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, we're told that Abraham actually, even though he tried to keep the law, he was unable to keep the law. 
And it was actually the law doesn't save at all, but and his obedience didn't save him, but his faith saved him. And that's how you can just dovetail right into a conversation about your faith and what you believe. So it takes a little creativity, a little work, but these things are out there all of the time. The last one I would just mention quickly is the brokenness bridge. You know, the, the Bible speaks directly to our brokenness. And we know that the, the Lord is close to those that are brokenhearted. So as we look at people and the struggles they're going through, um, we meet them where they are. We, we, we mourn with them and we talk to them about how there's hope in Christ. And, and, that, and that pathway up to Jesus it can happen through a million different ways. But I think those are just some simple bridges. And there are many more, but those are five I think are most common that I use and I think could be helpful to you as well. You know, church family, when it comes to speaking a good word for Jesus, I like to stay on the outer rim. I like to do servant evangelism projects where there's less evangelism and more service, right? I think that's where we're all more comfortable. That's not where we're called to stay. And we're going to come back next week. We're going to talk about what is the gospel, but maybe more important to that conversation is how do we articulate the gospel in a way that makes us comfortable, makes them comfortable, and that is faithful to the word of God. And that's going to be our topic for next week. Come back, same bat channel, same bat time, and, uh, and we'll talk about the gospel. Let me close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus tells us that we're to let our light shine before others, that people may see our, our good deeds and they may glorify uh, our Father in heaven. And Lord, I pray that we would be that as ninth and O. We've been around for 116 years. Uh, we've been around for a while, Lord. And God, it has always been our goal to be that like a city on a hill, that we have a light that shines out for the whole world to see it. And Lord, I pray that we would grow in our faithfulness to the gospel. I pray that we would grow in our love for people. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would align with that of our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.